All right, so our participant count is, is growing. I think we'll uh, go ahead and get uh, started. So uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, virtually uh, to the weekly medical physics seminar, the Friday noon talk. Um, normally we'd be on site at the Glen, but of course we're doing this through Zoom for the last little while now. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Stephanie Ruel, Ruel um, who is from the Open University in the UK. In fact, uh, Dr. Ruel is formerly from the Canadian Space Agency where she has led many missions on into space aboard various uh, platforms. She's now a lecturer, as I've mentioned particularly in organizational behavior at the Department for People and Organizations in the Faculty of Business and Law at the Open University. Um, at the moment, she speaks to us from Montreal uh, and her academic appointment uh, will eventually bring her to move to the UK. Um, her award-winning research, including a recent book titled STEM Professional Women's Exclusion in the Canadian Space in Industry, focuses on historical and contemporary concerns in STEM context. And this is what uh, Dr. Well is here to talk to us about today. So there'll be a presentation and then there'll be some time to uh, ask questions at the end. So without further ado, Dr. Well. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Eve, for welcoming me. Uh, I'm really excited to, to be with you today. Um, so some things that I'm gonna talk about uh, before I open up the floor to questions is I'm going to introduce you to who I am and who I am becoming and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my space missions with you. Then I'm going to turn more to the scholarly side of things. Uh, so what do I study and then jump into some of the historical and contemporary research that I've done. And then I'll talk a little bit about how to help uh, STEM professional women reclaim their space and what we can do to undo some of the discrimination and oppression experiences that these STEM professional women have had to deal with. So a little bit about who I am. Well, first and foremost, I'm a mom to four kids. Um, so I'm very fortunate today. I have, I think, only one child online. Um, as many of you know, in these COVID times, uh, school has been uh, sent to online environments. Usually we're all fighting for bandwidth, but today I, I'm really happy to report that th there's no fight. So things, uh, fingers crossed, should go very well. Um, None of this would be possible, and I mean none of my research and my experiences in the space industry would be possible without my partner, uh, who actually happens to be a physicist and um, works also in the space industry as a flight dynamics analyst. So I was, until very recently, the only Canadian woman life sciences mission manager at the Canadian Space Agency. So what does that mean to be a life sciences mission manager? It means that I did life science experiments on the space shuttle and the International Space Station and other microgravity platforms. And uh, I worked quite extensively with astronauts. And this is a picture of me with Katie Coleman, one of my mentors, and one of the first women uh, USOS astronauts to uh, join NASA. I was also affectionately called uh, the, a space princess by my colleagues. Um, as the only woman mission manager in all of Canada, uh, I wore my crown, which you see here uh, with uh, fur around it, uh, because you know how usually cold it is in Canada, to reflect uh, my space princess uh, positioning. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more uh, as I consider the scholarly side of things. So prior to uh, being in a classroom, the control room that you see pictured here was where I worked uh, a lot of the operations. This is the control room at the Canadian Space Agency, where we would interact with astronauts who were on the International Space Station and also interacting with various partners around the world, including the National Aeronautics and Space Administration or NASA, uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, Agency and Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency. 
Now, since then, uh, I started to ask a, a very important and pivotal question in 2012. Why is it that I am the only woman uh, life sciences mission manager in all of Canada? How can that be? And that was the basis of my dissertation research. I decided to delve into how it can be that I am the only woman in this position. And I'm happy to report I convocated and those are my two youngest children, which you see from the original picture. They've grown quite a bit, um, but they've all been very supportive of my research and my move to academia. Now, I'd like to share this picture with everybody to show that um, this is the very first time I was doing an academic presentation and I was terrified out of my mind. So that's me looking absolutely terrified, reading from a script, not able to look at the audience. I'm happy to report that I've grown as an academic. I have um, developed my, uh, my speaking abilities, I hope, um, and I'm a lot more confident talking with people. So I like to share this with you, especially uh, since Eve uh, told me that there's some graduate students that are involved in this. Um, with a lot of practice and presentation, uh, you'll get better at it, trust me. All right, so some of my missions um, in life sciences um, include <laughs> a project that we called Snakes in Space, where we studied 60 invertebrates uh, flying in microgravity aboard the Falcon, which is run by the National Research Council. And this was run by high school students. Probably one of the best uh, run missions that uh, I've ever had the pleasure of leading. Um, these grade 11 students did a fantastic job. And I'm happy to report that of the 60 invertebrates that flew in space, 59 uh, made it very well. One of them, unfortunately, did not make it, but he was looking a little green before the flight. Another uh, mission that I've run is um, Elarad, which was. Um, studying the effects of uh, radiation on um, the genome of uh, particular types of worms. So we affectionately call this mission Worms in Space. I've also done um, a lot of different types of research. Um, this one, Busy or Bodies in the Space Environment, was uh, studying the visual perception uh, adaptation uh, that happens in uh, the International Space Station in long duration space flights. So I've had um, the pleasure of leading a number of missions um, in uh, various uh, types of platforms. The last two missions that I focused on were at home in space, where we studied how astronauts build culture in basically a tin can in the ISS. So in other words, how do they build a sense of home in a tin can and um, how do they interact uh, amongst themselves for six months or even longer aboard the space station? The other uh, experiment that I worked on was wayfinding. Again, this is um, a visual perception experiment um, where we used MRI studies to help us uh, determine how the visual perception centers um, of the brain adjust to microgravity uh, before flight and after flight. So I'm gonna move a little bit now to the more scholarly side of things to give you an idea of uh, what I'm gonna talk about today beyond my experiences uh, in space. So there's an important focus in organizations and in scholarly work on things like governance policy and legislation. And the idea with these studies is to look at and undo discrimination and oppression. So you might be familiar with things like the Canadian Human Rights Act or employment equity and the different provincial and territorial human rights laws that are in place to protect individuals um, from discrimination and oppression. Now, my work does obviously take into account these various frameworks, but what I look at is the actual day-to-day -day social interactions among individuals in the North American space industry. And I focus on diversity and inclusion initiatives. So I look at discrimination and oppression, but I'm also looking to change the day-to-day -day social interactions so that we can improve diversity and inclusion initiatives. Uh, 
So the things that I look at are um, globally discourses. And what I mean by globally discourses is things like myths, stories, and narratives that permeate the space industry. So an example of a myth that probably a lot of you are aware of is the right stuff myth, which is based on a hyper-masculine discourse that says that the white man is the only one, and a test pilot, is the only one that can go in space. And we saw this extensively with, um, in the 1960s with the efforts to go to the moon. I also look at identities. And in particular, I use intersectionality scholarship, which is based on Crenshaw's work. And Crenshaw looked at legislative um, impacts of intersectional identities. Now, what I mean by that is, um, Crenshaw and those who use this uh, scholarship look at a complex person. So we don't look at one particular identity, so say a woman, we actually look at um, gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, sexual preference, class, everything being mixed in together. And with this complex person, um, we see an order that starts to emerge or a positioning that puts this person below another person. The other framework that I use is critical sense making. Um, so critical sense making looks at how we make sense of these complex identities and how they intersect and the power that flows throughout our day to day social interactions. So I'll give you an example and I'll use myself as that example. So you can separate out your identities into self identities and social identities. So a self identity could be, for example, as I introduced myself uh, at the beginning, um, I'm a mother. Uh, I also self identify as being French Canadian. Social identities are identities that are given to you. They're attributed to you. So for example, when I worked in the Canadian space industry, I was given the identity of being a life sciences mission manager. As a subset of these social identities, there's something called anchor points. And if you will, these are, these are like labels that people give to you temporarily to try and make sense of who you are and who you're becoming. So one <laughs> important anchor point that was attributed to me by my colleagues was a space princess because I was the only woman working as a life sciences mission manager in Canada. Um, they affectionately gave me this anchor point of being a space princess. Now, another example of an anchor point um, comes from a particular meeting that I was in. Now, as you can imagine, I was often the only woman sitting at the table. And in this particular meeting, which was getting very contentious, um, we were having an operational problem. And this was with colleagues. So this was with my peers, the other mission managers that, that worked um, in the same area as I did. And one particular individual and I just could not reach consensus on this particular um, issue. So... Um, instead of continuing to debate, uh, he uh, threw out his hand, arm on the table and said, okay, Stephanie, let's arm wrestle this. Um, and whoever wins the arm wrestle will win this discussion. Now, the problem with that is um, this individual was ex-military, um, very physically fit and was actually in the reserves. And so physically, there was just no way that it was possible for me to beat him. Even though I work out and I'm physically fit, there was just, I, I knew that there was just no way that I could win that arm wrestle um, resolution that he was looking for. Now, some people would think that this is great that um, this individual was approaching me in this way because he was considering me one of the guys. So that is an example of another type of anchor point. Now, you could look at the, the negative side of this arm wrestle as a positioning of me below him physically because he knew and I knew that there was no way that I could beat him in an arm wrestle. 
Another example of an anchor point, um, the feminine nurturing voice, again happened um, just before entering into a meeting. Now, I was the only woman, again, um, waiting to go into this meeting. We were all standing in the hallway. And a senior executive came up uh, to me and noticed that I was waiting to go into the meeting. And he leaned over and said, oh, Stephanie, I'm so glad you're here. You are going to calm these guys down. You're going to make these guys behave. And we're going to get stuff done in this meeting. So you know, on the surface, you could say this is this is great. He was recognizing one that I was bringing something important to the table. And so he was trying to get me to embrace the feminine nurturing voice to settle down these boys around the table. The negative side of this positioning is that, well, he was treating the men around the table as boys who needed to be uh, calmed down by a mother figure. So um, the idea with anchor points is yes, they're labels and yes, they're temporary and they can be generated within, you know, day-to-day -day social interactions. And, um, you know, when you walk out of the meeting, chances are you've completely forgotten about um, the attribution of this anchor point or this label. All right, so. <laughs> I'm going to slow down a bit. I get very excited about um, talking about my research, so I'm sorry if I'm talking very fast. I'm going to drink water just to slow myself down. All right. <clears throat> so what's interesting um, within these social dynamics um, in the contemporary space industry is that there's an important historical aspect to um, these anchor points. So my uh, research right now looks at both um, US and Canada space histories and uh, contemporary North American space industry. Now, uh, we're starting to hear a lot more about women's experiences um, in the US uh, space industry uh, during the Cold War. Uh, recently at the 70th um, IAC meeting in October, 2019, uh, Ms. Holstein Hornstein uh, came out from the shadows and talked about her experiences during the Apollo era. There's also um, probably uh, everybody's heard about the book and the movie uh, Hidden Figures, which focused on um, three women, uh, three African American women's experiences at NASA um, as uh, mathematicians and um, what we recognize now as human computers. Um, and you've probably also heard um, about this control room for Apollo uh, filled with men. And um, it was brought to light um, recently by the woman who's sitting in this blue circle that she was the only woman um, in the NASA based uh, control room helping um, with the landing of men on the moon. Now, my research um, extends um, these uh, ideas that we have about women's experiences in the US uh, based industry. I've looked at Ruth Bates Harris, <clears throat> pardon me, who was the first African American woman uh, to be hired in NASA's uh, senior management in the early 1970s. Um, she had a very difficult time uh, working in this all white man environment, uh, so much so that two years after being um, hired, she had a, a mental breakdown and um, chronicled her very difficult way back from that mental breakdown caused by the discrimination and oppression that she experienced at NASA in her book entitled Harlem Princess. The other uh, piece of research that I've done is looking at Pan American Airways, uh, GMRD White Women, GMRD standing for the Guided Missile Range Division. Um, a lot of these uh, white women were positioned as the wife or the hostess who would look after the men who worked at the GMRD. And again, <laughs> Um, we see the space princess coming back uh, at us, but from a historical pers perspective. Um, in this image that you see um, one of these space princesses, they would have um, typically 
monthly competitions among the secretaries to crown the space princess and have them um, sit with uh, space hardware that would uh, typically be shot into space or have uh, returned from space. Now, moving to Canada, we see um, the reproduction of this hyper feminine or maternal feminism coming forth um, in research that uh, I've looked at. So you see this reproduction of the space princess <clears throat> and the office wife coming back at us. You also see a hyper masculine portrayal of men that they were the heroes that were gonna save the free world. Now, um, you may not be familiar with Alouette. Um, Alouette was the first uh, Canadian satellite launched into space in 1962. This marked Canada as the third spacefaring nation after the Russians and the Americans. Now, why is it important to consider Alouette one? Well, in all the commemorative activities that we found, so media reports, press releases, formal anniversaries, we see a reproduction of the 100 men that are central to the rhetoric of the success of the Alouette One launch or the Alouette One design, manufacturing, testing, launch and operation. And in my contemporary career in the space industry, we would reproduce um, these discourses of the 100 men um, that, that um, led to the success of this mission. Now, what's interesting with this is um, this is uh, the silver anniversary plaque of Canada being in space. Um, there's 105 names on this plaque. And when we started to take a closer look at these names, we discovered that five of these names were women's names. So somehow we have pushed aside women's contributions to uh, Canada's innovative step into space and focused on just the 100 men who contributed to Alouette One. So what my research um, is trying to do by looking at Alouette One and um, its sister Alouette Two is to try and write Canadian women back into the space histories of the early Cold War. To date, we found um, uh, one single report a media report that uh, shows a woman um, interacting with Alouette One. And again, we see um, this representation of a space princess. We have found over 120 women who worked on Alouette Women, uh, who worked on Alouette One, sorry. Um, a lot of them are STEM professional women. So uh, people like Phyllis Timlick, Doris Jelly, and Dr. Louise Hertzberg uh, all worked in uh, various groups uh, based in Ottawa. Looking, uh, for example, Doris uh, worked in the physics section and the ionosphere group. Dr. Louise Hertzberg, uh, who passed away in the early 1970s, had a prolific career after um, looking after looking after her husband, her children, her parents. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years of her career, she was able to publish and um, garner uh, a lot of respect in the areas of uh, ionosphere research and um, in physics, in, in pure uh, physics of the time. We also have important people like Ethel Moore and Pat Butler who made important contributions uh, with their uh, sketches of Alouette One uh, during the design phase and uh, photography activities that, that uh, Pat took on. I won't go through all of the names, but um, I think it's important that we recognize that women did have an important contribution to make to uh, space and space exploration. And uh, what we've tried to do is uh, publish as many um, of these women's experiences in the industry as possible to get these experiences out. The, the most recent publication is the Canadian Alouette Women Reclaiming Their Space in the Historical Organization Studies book. So that's a little bit about the history. I'm gonna move now to contemporary concerns. 
Um, and what I did was I looked at the lack of women in STEM management positions in the Canadian space industry. I don't necessarily look at quantitative measures um, such as quotas and meeting those quotas. What I really focus on is um, the qualitative side, the qualitative side of things. So the stories and myths and discourses that we see that, that permeate this industry. Now, having said that, I, I know a lot of people want specific uh, statistics to give them an idea of what this industry looks like. If we look at just the private space organizations, um, we see very few women uh, being um, appearing in board positions. Um, one of the biggest industry players in the Canadian space industry is MDA, McDonald Detweiler Associates. Um, and we've seen uh, very few women. The most that I found so far is two women that sat on the board. Um, in 2019 when they were under uh, Maxar, which is a US-based conglomerate. Uh, another company <clears throat> is SCD or Callion now. Um, historically, this has always been uh, run by eight white men and there have been uh, no women uh, on the board. Within the public sphere, um, so there's various uh, space-based organizations, so the Canadian Space Agency and um, National Defense uh, Canada, um, we have a lot more visibility into um, the, the stats, the, the statistical representation of complex individuals. Now, um, historically, uh, up until late 2016, there was only one STEM professional woman uh, that held a STEM executive position. And as far as the feeder groups into these EX positions, so EX minus one and EX minus two, there was one woman um, in an engineering position and I was the only Canadian woman uh, mission manager as an EX minus one. So I had a scientist designation. Since that time, uh, a lot of efforts have been made uh, to have more women placed in executive positions, and some uh, are not STEM trained. Now, you might hear a lot of calls to consider um, workforce availability rates. So this is the, the pipeline idea um, that there aren't enough women in the pipeline um, to feed into these management positions. Now, this pipeline idea has been debunked in academia. We're trying to move uh, very much away from this pipeline idea and this critical mass uh, of women um, in positions to be able to fill into those EX and EX minus one and EX minus two. So we're now looking more at the day-to-day -day social interactions. So one example um, of my research uh, is uh, Gerrit, uh, these are all anonymized names. Um, she was an early uh, career STEM professional woman. Uh, she, that means that she had less than five years of experience in the space industry. And already we could see these labels or these anchor points uh, coming forward in her day-to-day -day social interactions. Um, some of them, were unfortunately um, quite um, common. We've, we've heard this before that uh, women are, when they take a leadership role uh, or they are assertive, they can be called the bitch. Um, and at other times she was recognized as the leader uh, in um, spacecraft knowledge and um, in, in her role um, within the uh, private company that she took on. Um, this is another individual that, um, that was part of my research. Uh, Vigrin was a late career STEM professional. She had over 25 years of experience in the industry. The unfortunate reality for uh, late career STEM professional women is that there has been a lot of damage done by the discrimination and oppression that they live on a daily basis. Um, 
like I said, she had extensive uh, technical uh, experience in the industry that she worked in. Um, she was well regarded by a lot of individuals, but there were some individuals who uh, did not see the contributions that she brought to the table. One particular individual uh, attributed her the anchor point of how can we count on you? You're a woman, you have kids. Um, this type of anchor point is often reproduced by, um, by late um, career STEM professional women uh, because they are constantly challenged as to how can they work and still raise children. Um, another anchor point that she was attributed is um, she did not have a PhD, she had an MSc, um, and she had been told that she really had nothing to bring anymore because she didn't have a PhD and she was an old woman, so she, therefore she was worthless. Probably, um, for me, emotionally, the most disturbing anchor point that she shared with me in the three hour interview that we had together is that she was called uh, a dog. Um, so she was said, she was told that she was like a dog and that she had to be kept on a leash. Now, um, she had so internalized this anchor point that at times I wondered if it wasn't a self identity for her. Um, because during this three hour interview, she actually referred to herself in the third person as a dog. Um, so the damage that is done by this positioning cannot be ignored. Um, and even though we have, um, you know, policies and laws that say that we cannot discriminate against people, these types of discourses are still occurring uh, in this industry and they are indeed positioning um, this, this STEM professional woman to be below everybody else, to be this dog that needs to be kept on a leash. So in light of <clears throat> some of these findings, what can we do about this, these positionings? So what I look at in particular with my research is micropolitical resistance. Now the idea with micropolitical resistance is that you as an individual can do a number of things uh, to protect yourself, to question what's happening and to help other individuals in their day-to-day -day social interactions to undo these discriminatory discourses. So for example, uh, one of the findings uh, from my research is that early career STEM professional women are not necessarily aware of these anchor points or these labels. And so um, my job as an academic and as a former life sciences mission manager is to start to create awareness about these anchor points and how we position individuals. With regard to mid-career STEM professional women, they seem to be navigating um, this state of awareness and unawareness with respect to anchor points. So one of the jobs that I take on is to question um, these anchor points for them to get them to start thinking about it and to heighten their awareness. With regard to late career STEM professional women, this is possibly the hardest position to be in. There's so much damage that's been done um, that they need support to untangle this damage. Um, and when I say support, I mean, uh, in some cases, professional, psychological support, um, support from management um, to reaffirm their value to the organization and um, to create group dynamics where late career STEM professional women can bond together to try and undo um, the damage that's been done. One of uh, my research initiatives with um, my colleague in Finland, um, we've tried to break out uh, a sort of a theoretical framework for these micro resistance um, um, activities. And what we've come up with is that we can move from silence to voice, whether it's inside or outside of an organization. So one example of 
of a voice would be posting something on a social media platform. So um, doing a Twitter post, um, for example, saying, you know, somebody just called me, you're a dog, you need to be kept on a leash. What do I do? How do I, how do I undo this positioning, for example? There's also uh, different types of uh, grassroots activism that can happen um, in developing voice. So uh, the Me Too movement is, is a very important grassroots activist uh, activity that we've seen growing here in North America, less so in Finland. Um, we also saw something um, very interesting in our research and that's exit behavior. Some women, um, especially those in the mid-career uh, STEM profession. Um, so this is 10 to 15 years of experience in the industry are making exit plans and how they can get out of this industry to move on to other activities. So um, what I'm here <laughs> to um, to state based on my research is that diversity and inclusion really is not empty jargon. Yes, we need legislation and rules to undo discrimination, but we also need to be aware of those day-to-day uh, -day social interactions, the systemic discrimination and those microaggressions that happen um, in the power dynamics of social interactions. And that we need to act individually and collectively to undo these discourses. Um, and sometimes acting does not have to happen right on the spot. And this is uh, an important um, aspect of my research where we've shown that sometimes, yes, you have to speak up right away and say, you know, why did you call me a dog? That's really inappropriate. But you also can give yourself permission to walk away from that conversation and take the time to think about it and follow up later and say, why did you call me a dog? Um, this is really um, not appropriate to position me in such a way. And a lot of um, grassroots activism's uh, recommendations that we're seeing is to not stay silent, um, and to make a stand right away. But what we're finding is um, that we need to sometimes take that time to think about how we're going to react to that and uh, perhaps collectively um, come back and um, push back against these position uh, experiences. So what I'm doing here is I'm making a call to create um, opportunities to transform social orders uh, by looking not just at contemporary discourses, but also at the historical impacts of discourses on organizations, to embrace those micropolitical uh, resistances and to move away from uh, cis women's sole responsibilities in the face of discrimination and to include uh, cis men and men's responsibilities above and beyond an exercise in blame. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me. 